Hi there, it's Friday the 17th of May 2019. I'm Steve Towers. Welcome to ITB. Let's get started. In France, the DST bill is currently before the Senate. This week, the Senate Finance Committee proposed a number of amendments to the bill, including a three-year limitation. The new tax would cease to apply by the 1st of January 2022 at the latest. The bill will be debated by the full Senate next week. Elsewhere in the EU, ECOFIN is holding a meeting today in Brussels. Included on the agenda is a debate on digital taxation in the international context. The European Commission is keen to ensure that the EU has a united position in discussions with the OECD's inclusive framework. According to a US Treasury official, Discussions within the inclusive framework are showing a positive reception to the Pillar 2 proposal for a global minimum tax. However, he said, writing the rules for a global minimum tax is probably a greater technical challenge than anything the OECD has attempted to date. All design parameters are open for study and decision including whether it applies on a per country basis or an average basis or some other measurement criteria. However, the marketing intangibles proposal in Pillar 1 is encountering some pushback from developing countries in the inclusive framework, according to Carol Duran Klein of the US Council for International Business. At a conference last week in California, she said that the complexity of the proposal would prove difficult from an administrative viewpoint in developing countries. And also, even a simplified, stripped-down marketing intangibles proposal is not going to be suitable for developing countries. Some developing countries are not necessarily wedded to marketing, because they have natural resources or commodities and relatively small markets, and therefore they could be losers. This week, there have been some further developments in the China-US trade war. Firstly, China has retaliated by announcing increased tariff rates on $60 billion of imports from the US, effective the 1st of June. Nearly 2,500 items will be subject to one of four new rates, 5%, 10%, 20% and 25%. For a copy of China's announcement, please go to our website or app. Meanwhile, in the US, the legal procedures for the threatened imposition of 25% customs duty on a further $300 billion of imports from China have started. The US Trade Representative has released this week a notice on this topic, including an annex which identifies the relevant products. For a copy of the notice, please go to our website or app. The OECD has released all of the public comments it has received in regard to its discussion draft, What is Driving Tax Morale? For a copy of the comments, please go to our website or app.
In China, the government has issued Circular 64 in regard to the tax treatment of perpetual bonds, the income on which can be treated as either interest or dividends for Chinese tax purposes. The circular has retrospective operation from the 1st of January 2019. For a copy of the circular, please go to our website or app. In India, the Mumbai Income Tax Appellate Tribunal has decided a case in regard to the definition of fees for technical services in Article 12 of the India-Netherlands Treaty. That definition relevantly says this, For the purposes of this article, fees for technical services means payments of any kind to any person in consideration for the rendering of any technical or consultancy services. If such services, b, make available technical knowledge, experience, skill, know-how or processes, or consist of the development and transfer of a technical plan or technical design. This definition was effectively imported into Article 12 by the triggering of the Most Favoured Nation Clause in the Protocol. The text was borrowed from the corresponding definition in the India-US Treaty. There are three points which should be noted with this definition. Firstly, the main part of the definition refers to the rendering of any technical or consultancy services. That's a narrower phrase than what is frequently found in the corresponding definitions in India's treaties. Frequently, the definition refers to the rendering of any managerial, technical or consultancy services. The absence of managerial was key in this case. Secondly, the definition contains conjunctive conditions. The make available condition in paragraph B must also be satisfied. And thirdly, that make available condition does not include the additional words which are sometimes found in the corresponding definitions in India's treaties. Those additional words are which enables the person acquiring the services to apply the technology contained therein. The facts of the case are quite straightforward. A Netherlands company provided services pursuant to a written contract to its Indian subsidiary. The contract referred to the services as management services. However, the detailed description of the services included some items which could be considered to be technical or consulting in nature, such as information technology, R&D and strategic purchasing. The tribunal said this, as can be seen from the definition under the tax treaty, managerial service is not included under the definition of fees for technical services. Therefore, though some services rendered by the assessee may have the trappings of technical or consultancy service, however, the core activity of the assessee under the agreement is providing managerial services. So the tribunal did not attempt to carve out the technical or consulting items. Instead, it concluded that the essential character of the services, the core activity, was managerial in nature, and therefore the definition was not satisfied. Thus, it was unnecessary for the tribunal to consider the make available condition in paragraph B. But they did so, and they concluded that that condition was not satisfied either. Interestingly, the tribunal said that the make available condition, as interpreted by other tribunals and courts in India, requires that the service recipient be able to apply the technology, the knowledge, experience, skill, etc. independently. The tribunal said that there was no evidence that this was the situation in this case, 
and therefore the make available condition was not satisfied. However, remember I noted earlier that the make available condition in the Indian Netherlands Treaty does not contain the additional words that you sometimes find in corresponding definitions in other treaties, which enables the person acquiring the services to apply the technology contained therein. It seems to me that the tribunal might have effectively read these additional words into the definition in the India-Netherlands Treaty. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In Indonesia, the government has issued Regulation PMK 35, which sets out the requirements for a PE to exist under domestic law and the taxpayer's obligations if a PE does exist. The definition in the regulation is broadly similar to Article 5 of the OECD and UN model treaties. It includes five types of PE. Place of business, construction, installation or assembly project, services performed in Indonesia for a period which exceeds 60 days within a 12 month period, dependent agent, but without requiring the conclusion of contracts or the maintenance of a stock of goods, and insurance agent. For a copy of this regulation, please go to our website or app. In Malaysia, the tax authorities have issued updated guidance in regard to the Malaysian income tax treatment of electronic commerce transactions. To be clear, this guidance is limited to income tax. It does not consider the sales and services tax. And also, the focus of the guidance is on domestic law. There is only a minor reference to double tax treaties. One notable aspect of the guidance is the significant cross-border impact of the widening of the definition of royalty in 2017 to include payments for the use of or the right to use software. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. In Myanmar, the government has issued Notification 38 of 2019, which reimposes the 2% creditable advance income tax on exports by taxpayers under the Large Taxpayers Office and the Medium Taxpayers Office No. 1. The reimposition was effective on the 1st of May 2019. For a copy of the notification, please go to our website or app. The European Court of Justice has decided a VAT case in regard to the provision of fuel cards by a parent company to its subsidiary. Here are the facts. A number of fuel suppliers issue fuel cards to the subsidiary. The subsidiary uses one or more of the fuel cards to acquire fuel for its vehicles. The fuel suppliers issue their invoices, which include VAT, to the parent company, which pays the invoices. At the end of each month, the parent company recharges the cost of the fuel, plus 2%, to the subsidiary. The subsidiary is permitted to offset that recharge against its own invoices issued to the parent company or to pay the recharge amount within one to three months. Based on these facts, the court held that the parent was not purchasing fuel from the fuel suppliers and then on selling it to the subsidiary. Instead, the transaction between the parent company and the subsidiary was the provision of a service granting credit. That transaction is exempt from VAT. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. 
the European General Court has annulled the European Commission state aid decision in regard to Poland's tax on the retail sector. The court described the tax in this way. All retailers were liable to pay tax under that law, irrespective of their legal status. The tax was based on the turnover of the companies concerned and was progressive in nature. The basis of assessment was a monthly turnover of more than 17 million Polish zloty. The tax rates applied to such a monthly turnover were 0.8% from 17 million zloty to 170 million inclusive and 1.4% beyond 170 million zloty. The Commission had decided that the tax constituted illegal state aid due to its progressive rate structure, which effectively meant that retailers with higher turnover had a higher tax burden than those with lower turnover. The court rejected that basis. As regards a turnover tax, an adaption criterion in the form of progressive taxation as from a certain threshold, even a high threshold, which may reflect the intention to tax the activity of an undertaking only when that activity reaches a certain level, does not in itself imply the existence of a selective advantage. The court has issued a press release which summarises the case. For a copy of the press release, please go to our website or app. There have been two other developments in regard to state aid in the EU. Firstly, the European Commission has published the full non-confidential version of its decision to open an in-depth state aid investigation in regard to the Slovak Republic's retail turnover tax. And secondly, the Commission has invited public comments on its in-depth state aid investigation of the tax rulings issued by Luxembourg to the Hutomaki Group. For a copy of both of these documents, please go to our website or app. In regard to VAT fraud, which is a huge problem in the EU, the European Commission has announced the launch of the Transaction Network Analysis TNA, system, which is described as a new tool that will allow member states to rapidly exchange and jointly process VAT data, leading to earlier detection of suspicious networks. For a copy of the Commission's press release on this topic, please go to our website or app. Also in regard to VAT, the Commission has released two related reports in regard to the EU's VAT refund and reimbursement procedures. For a copy of the two reports, please go to our website or app. In Hungary, it's been reported that the tax authorities are considering a trial of the standard audit file for tax scheme, which has already been implemented in nine EU member states. In Italy, the tax authorities have issued regulations which allow a multinational to request a ruling on whether it has a PE in Italy, and if so, the determination of the profits attributable to the PE. In addition, the ruling would cover the VAT aspects of whether there is a PE. The advantage of doing so, particularly if the ruling is unfavourable, is to reduce the level of penalties which would be imposed by the tax authorities if they were to assert the existence of a PE. A ruling request is limited to non-resident entities which satisfy all of three conditions. They are part of a multinational group with global turnover exceeding 1 billion euros in one of the last three years. 
They supply goods or services in Italy with a value exceeding 50 million euros, also in one of the last three years. And such supplies are made with the support of one or more Italian resident group companies or Italian PEs of the group. In Norway, the Tax Appeals Board has decided a case in regard to the attribution of profits to a PE under the 2008 edition of the OECD Model Treaty. As you know, the 2008 and 2010 editions of the OECD Model Treaty reflect the watershed in the OECD's approach to Article 7, the Business Profits Article. In the 2010 edition, Article 7 was rewritten to conform with the so-called Authorised OECD Approach, the AOA, which involves the full implementation of the independent separate entity fiction. In contrast, in the 2008 edition, Article 7 was not amended, but nevertheless, the OECD commentary attempts to apply the AOA in part. It's the in part that's critical in this case. The treatment of fictional transactions between the foreign head office and the Norwegian PE of a non-resident company. The actual facts in the case are shown on the left side. A non-resident company has a PE in Norway. It's not clear what the company's business is, but it is clear that it derives income from customers in Norway and that the PE is the part of the company which is primarily involved with the income derivation. The right side shows the independent separate entity fiction which is required under Article 7.2 of the OECD Model Treaty, both editions. It shows a fictional head office company and a fictional PE company. The parties accepted that the income from customers should be reflected as income of the PE company. The issue in dispute was how to reflect the transfer of employees and equipment from the head office to the PE. The taxpayer argued that those transfers should attract an arm's length price, notionally charged by head office company to PE company. However, the tax authorities argued that the transfers should be at cost only. The in-part implementation of the AOA in the 2008 OECD commentary reflects the OECD's difficulty in fitting the square peg of Article 7.3 into the round hole of the AOA. The compromise which the commentary adopts is this. The question must be whether the internal transfer of property and services, be it temporary or final, is of the same kind as those which the enterprise, in the normal course of its business, would have charged to a third party at an arm's length price. That is, by normally including in the sale price an appropriate profit. On the one hand, the answer to that question will be in the affirmative if the expense is initially incurred in performing a function the direct purpose of which is to make sales of a specific good or service and to realise a profit through a permanent establishment. On the other hand, the answer will be in the negative if, on the basis of the facts and circumstances of the specific case, it appears that the expense is initially incurred in performing a function, the essential purpose of which is to rationalise the overall costs of the enterprise or to increase in a general way its sales. In the first situation, an arm's length price should be used, whereas in the second situation, cost should be used. 
the dispute between the taxpayer and the tax authorities was effectively in regard to the application of this OECD compromise to the facts of the case. The taxpayer argued that it was in the first situation, whereas the tax authorities took the position that it was the second situation. The Tax Appeals Board decided in favour of the tax authorities, although I would say that the report of the decision doesn't give you all the information and analysis which you would ideally want in order to verify that view. If you'd like to see for yourself, you can find a copy of the case at our website or app. Also in Norway, the government has launched a public consultation on a draft bill to amend the country's R&D tax incentive. Public comments are requested by the 2nd of August. For information on the consultation, please go to our website or app. In Russia, it's been reported that the tax authorities are allowing Russian B2B customers of non-resident providers of digital services to withhold and remit the VAT, instead of the non-resident provider being required to account for the VAT. Spain is the latest EU member state to propose the reduction in the VAT rate for digital publications. In Spain's case, the rate is proposed to drop from 21% to 4%. In Switzerland on Sunday, the long-awaited referendum on the proposed federal tax reform legislation known as TRAF will be held. The latest indications are that TRAF will likely be approved. We'll see. In the UK, the first tier tribunal has decided a case in regard to the UK's unallowable purpose rules. A UK group provided funding to its US subgroup by means of a so-called tower structure. No, it was not named after me. The UK group's purpose in implementing that structure was to obtain a US tax deduction for interest expense, together with a flat tax outcome in the UK. That is, in net terms, no taxable income and no tax loss in the UK. However, in implementing the structure, one UK company, the taxpayer in the case, obtained a tax deduction for interest expense, although that deduction was effectively netted to nil via UK group relief. The tax authorities argued that the UK company should be denied the tax deduction for interest expense because its purpose in entering into the transaction was to secure that tax deduction and that triggered the unallowable purpose rules. The tribunal decided in favour of the tax authorities and therefore the whole of the interest deduction was denied. This case is interesting for two reasons. Firstly, the application of the unallowable purpose rules on a specific taxpayer basis, even though the UK group's purpose for the whole structure was not to produce an overall net deduction situation in the UK. And secondly, before the UK group implemented the structure, it obtained a favourable clearance from the tax authorities in regard to the anti-arbitrage rules. However, because the tax authorities at that time had no intention of challenging the structure under the unallowable purpose rules, the favourable clearance under the anti-arbitrage rules did not prevent the tax authorities from subsequently challenging the structure under the unallowable purpose rules. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app.
In Mauritania, the government has published a new general tax code, which consolidates all tax rules into a single document. There are only a few tax law changes in the new code, but one which should be noted is that there is a new corporation tax which will replace two existing taxes. The new code will be effective the 1st of January 2020. For a copy of the new code and a copy of the tax authority's announcement, please go to our website or app. In Rwanda, the government has published several ministerial orders in regard to tax. Two of these orders are worth noting. The first sets out the circumstances in which a company will be considered to have its place of effective management and therefore its tax residence in Rwanda. And the second sets out the conditions for a taxpayer to carry forward tax losses for more than five years. For a copy of these two orders, please go to our website or app. In Brazil, the tax authorities have published a private ruling which clarifies the calculation of the deduction for interest on net equity, JCP, the Portuguese acronym. For a copy of the ruling, please go to our website or app. In the US, the Treasury and the IRS have released final regulations in regard to certain issues concerning qualified business units, QBUs. For a copy of the final regs, please go to our website or app. And also in the US, a Treasury official stated last week that Treasury is considering including a form of high tax exception in the final regulations for guilty. This would allow companies which are paying a relatively high foreign tax rate to be excluded from the guilty rules without being concerned that the allocation of expenses might significantly reduce their foreign tax credits in the guilty basket. Well, we should know very soon. The final regs were sent yesterday to the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs for final review. And now for this week's treaty developments. We've had three treaties signed and one treaty enter into force. I have two articles for you this week. The first article is called Taxing the Digital Economy Post BEPS Seriously. It's written by Andres Baez and Yarov Browner and it's published as a University of Florida Levin College of Law research paper. For a copy of the paper, please go to our website or app. This paper, which builds on earlier work by the two authors, advocates a broad-based withholding tax solution to the tax challenges of digitalization. Let me quickly run through the key elements of this proposed solution. It would be a low-rate withholding tax on all base-eroding payments to non-residents. The rate would be in the range of 3% to 10%. It's important that all participating countries agree on the rate and that it is uniformly applied. The withholding tax would apply primarily to base eroding payments to non-residents. That is, payments which are deductible in the source country for the payer. In fact, deductibility of such payments would be made conditional on the withholding tax requirements having been met. Non-base eroding payments, for example, payments by consumers, 
would be a secondary concern. However, the paper proposes that payments by consumers to non-residents would also be subject to the withholding tax, which would be collected by payment facilitators such as credit card companies and similar financial institutions. The withholding tax would not apply to payments made to non-residents which are already taxed in the source country on a net basis. Thus, payments made to a non-resident's source country PE would not be subject to the withholding tax. Also, the withholding tax would not apply to outbound payments of dividends or interest, but it would apply to outbound payments of royalties. The withholding tax would be a final tax. In other words, the non-resident would not be required to file an income tax return in the source country and be taxed on a net basis. The paper does refer to the possibility that the non-resident be given an option to file a return and be taxed on a net basis, claiming a credit for the withholding tax. However, it prefers the situation where the non-resident chooses up front to register in the source country, rather than giving the non-resident an after-the-event option. A new provision would be inserted into double tax treaties to allow the withholding tax to be imposed, despite the absence of a PE. That new provision would then generally require the residence country to provide double tax relief for the withholding tax under existing Article 23. The authors justify their proposed solution on a number of grounds, but the key one is this minimum change argument. International taxation is a conservative field and reforms of the international tax regime are particularly cautious in nature and therefore gradual reforms that are easily reconcilable with the current rules of the game are more likely to gain consideration, support and eventually legitimacy. It is impossible to completely avoid innovation if one genuinely wishes to face the challenges that the digital economy presents to the international tax regime. However, it is possible to do so with minimal incoherence as demonstrated by the withholding solution. All the elements of the withholding solution are familiar components of the current international tax regime. Withholding tax obligations, denial of deduction on base eroding payments if withholding is not made, registration in source jurisdictions and information reporting. Moreover, the withholding solution preserves all of the current regime's taxing rules by exempting them from the proposed withholding tax, leaving it applicable only to untaxed base eroding payments. The law and treaty changes required should be minimal and focused, further demonstrating its compatibility with the current regime. The second article is called Tax Policy in an Age of Cynicism. It's written by Cara Griffiths and it's published in Worldwide Tax Daily. This article is an adapted text from a lecture recently delivered by the author. The article focuses on the high level of cynicism in the US political environment and its impact on the development of tax policy. The author provides critical comments on the performances of academics, lobbyists, legislators, government agency officials and tax press. But strangely, no comments specifically about corporations or professional advisors. The author contrasts the 2017 US tax reform legislative process with the tax reform process which occurred in 1986. Rather than years of effort, the entire process was over in just a few months. 
Rather than a bipartisan effort, the effort was partisan from start to finish. Rather than open hearings, the process involved closed door meetings. Congress passed the measure in the middle of the night, on a weekend, with handwritten edits and notes in the margins of the drafts. Senators had mere hours to read and absorb the 479-page text before the Senate began voting on it. Not surprisingly, the rushed and chaotic process produced language in the legislation itself that is unclear. As is typical of tax legislation, the TCJA provides an overall framework, but leaves many technical questions unanswered. That left it to Treasury and the IRS to issue guidance to implement the intent of the White House and Congress in enacting the new law. Because the legislation was passed in such short order, however, policymakers didn't spend much time detailing their intent. So the TCJA made significant changes to the nation's tax law, particularly regarding international taxation, but it left no detailed legislative history to guide government agencies that must draft regulations, as they are now doing, to implement the law. So when it comes to cynicism about government, the TCJA was as much part of the problem as part of the solution. Well, that's the way it is this Friday, the 17th of May, 2019. The ITB team will be having a well-earned one week break. We'll be back full of life on Friday, the 31st of May. And that will be a special edition video. I'll be reviewing the top international tax cases so far in 2019. But until then, I'm Steve Towers. Have a great weekend.